Hi friends, today I want to talk about a video that I saw circulating on Twitter where the narrator describes how India would be able to counter China's influence given that China's main weakness is the Malacca Strait. It is reported by the narrator of that video that 70% of Chinese oil imports flow through this narrow passage between Malaysia and Indonesia and that India owns the Andaman and Nicobar Islands which are located at the west entrance to the strait. These 836 islands are grouped into two, the northern Adaman Islands and the southern Nicobar Islands, which are separated by a 150-kilometer channel. Now, for a long time, experts have claimed that the strait can easily be controlled by the Indian Navy and thus prevent China from getting the oil that it needs to run. As a person who reads about geopolitics, I was aware of the importance of the Malacca Strait, but I must admit that I was not aware of some of the details that today I would like to share with you. Spoiler alert, these facts might mitigate the concerns raised about the threat that the video is trying to instill in their viewers. So welcome to another video, friends. Before we go on, please make sure that you are still subscribed to this channel. I know that this website is doing some funky things to some of you and you have been unsubscribed without you knowing. It means a lot to me, so thank you. But let's get down to the topic. The first thing to say is that I believe that Beijing is fully aware of its supply chain vulnerability and has contingency plans in place to counter any potential blockade by India. The other thing to say is that India is unlikely to undertake such an action without the unwavering support of the United States, both militarily and politically. And this, after we have seen Modi hugging Vladimir Putin, casts doubt on the certainty of this support. But I know you've all come here to access factual information, so let's start working on that. According to the Institute for Supply Management, or ISM, in 2023, about 80% of China's oil imports pass through the Malacca Strait, uh, representing about 60% of China's entire oil supply. However, that very same year, ISM reports that Russia has surpassed Saudi Arabia to become China's largest oil supplier since China took advantage of Moscow's search for new buyers amid Western sanctions after they had started the Ukraine special military operation back in 2022. In 2023, Russia sent 7 million metric tons of crude oil, which represent a 24% increase from the year before, while Saudi Arabia shipped 85 million metric tons, a decrease of 2% from 2022. There are two primary considerations when we examine the transportation of Russian oil to China. The first pertains to the route. Russian oil reaches China primarily via the ESPO pipeline, which is also known as the East Siberian Pacific Ocean Pipeline. This 4,857-kilometer pipeline originates in Taishet, I apologize for the pronunciation, in eastern Siberia, and terminates at the Pacific Ocean Terminal in Cosmino. Again, apologies for the pronunciation if I get it wrong. The ESPO supplies oil to Japan, South Korea, and China. But since the commencement of the special military operation, both Japan and South Korea have curtailed their trade with Russia, while the mainland has significantly increased its consumption. This disparity is partly attributable to China's substantial oil storage capacity. Unlike Russia, which lacks significant storage facilities, China possesses 12 Strategic Petroleum Reserves, or SPRs, and is in the process of constructing five more. Currently, there are two pipelines connecting to the ESPO in the north of China, and they transport crude oil to state-owned refineries such as CNPC in Heilongjiang and to private refineries in Shandong province. Additionally, Russian exports crude oil to China through Kazakhstan via the atasu Alashanko pipeline. Again, Apologies for the pronunciation. Now, the second factor to consider is the existing supply contract between China and Russia. This agreement, which was finalized after 15 years of negotiation back in September 2012, has prompted some experts to suggest that it may limit the volume of oil that Russia can supply to China. However, the video that is circulating on Twitter portrays India in a belligerent light. The implication being that India would resort to a blockade of the Malacca Strait as an act of hostility. If such a scenario were to materialize, two potential outcomes could ensue. First, 
Russia and China might expedite an agreement to increase crude oil flows. Secondly, China could devise alternative methods for Saudi Arabia and the other nations to continue supplying oil. This would resemble the current situation where Russia is actually selling oil to India, despite India's status as a United States ally. Therefore, securing and augmenting oil supply constitutes only one aspect of the solution for China. The other critical component involves reducing oil demand. Notably, China has been making great strides in this area. According to S&P Global, crude oil import growth is projected to decelerate significantly in 2024, as you can see here in this graph. This reduction is attributed to the increasing adoption of electric vehicles and liquefied natural gas, coupled with enhanced energy efficiency, which collectively diminish the demand for gasoline and diesel. These factors elucidate the Chinese government's impetus for rapidly and extensively electrifying its vehicular fleet. When we look back at the development of China's new energy vehicles over the past 10 years, the Chinese government has played a very timely role in guiding the development of the industry, providing policy support and expanding the opening up of the industry. This electrification encompasses a broad spectrum from public transportation systems to both low-cost and high-end personal vehicles. Concurrently, the nation has exhibited remarkable speed in constructing charging infrastructure and, in the case of my own car, NEO, swapping battery infrastructure, as well as prioritizing the development and deployment of renewable energy sources, which include solar, wind, hydro, and nuclear power. Notably, China has achieved a significant breakthrough in nuclear technology just recently with the successful testing of a self-cooling reactor, substantially enhancing the safety and the applicability of this energy source for both domestic and international markets. Now, on a personal level, I've had the opportunity to visit a facility here in Dongguan, in Guangdong, where young entrepreneurs are working on the development and distribution of both onboard and outboard electric motors for marine vessels, from small fishing boats to large ferries. Furthermore, the emergence of flying taxi and prototypes that we have all seen everywhere on social media, these all signal a promising future of reduced reliance on fossil fuel imports for China. But even prior to achieving uh, a sufficient energy independence, these challenges have presented opportunities for Chinese industries and companies to diversify their supply chains and logistics. They have prompted exploration of novel partnerships and routes to mitigate potential risks. This brings us back to the critical importance of Xinjiang in China's future development. Furthermore, it is essential to recognize that any disruption to the Malacca Strait would have far-reaching consequences for industries across Europe and North America. Sectors such as automotive manufacturing, uh, electronics, retail and fashion, pharmaceuticals. Imagine Americans not getting their medicines. But there's also agriculture, there's food. This would all be adversely affected by such an event. Now, while Western economies may exhibit a lesser degree of dependence on the Malacca Strait for energy compared to East Asian nations, the interconnectedness of the global oil market is undeniable. Any disruption to a major supply route would inevitably lead to fluctuations in global oil prices, which would impact factors ranging from fuel costs to household energy bills. In conclusion, this video refutes these unfounded claims propagated by the aforementioned video. China's position as the world's manufacturing epicenter constitutes its primary defense against such threats. Moreover, in the hypothetical scenario of India pursuing a hostile course of action, China's substantial naval superiority with a fleet which is a size more than triple that of India's would serve as enough of a deterrent. All right, friends, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much for watching this video. And as always, if you liked it, give it a thumbs up. And if you like the work that I do, make sure to hit the subscribe button. And until I see you again, take it easy and bye for now.